Good afternoon. Welcome to this lecture by Professor Patrick Deneen entitled uh, Taking Populism Seriously. I'm Benjamin Story, the co-director of Furman's Tocqueville program, which is sponsoring today's lecture. And as we get started, let me ask everybody to uh, put your electronic devices in airplane mode for the duration of our flight and stow them in your seat back pocket. Um, to, the, uh, to the students here, uh, I also suggest that you take notes. Uh, Dr. Deneen is going to present us with a, with a sustained argument, and, and taking notes is the best way to follow the, uh, something like that. So as we, um, as we get started, before I, before I introduce today's speaker, I just want to say a word about what the Tocqueville program is and what we do. The Tocqueville program exists to encourage uh, serious and open engagement with the philosophic questions that are at the heart of political life. It includes an, a whole range of activities. We offer a signature course and lecture series uh, this year, which is, which is focused this year on the crisis of liberalism, and this is the first talk in that series. We also sponsor a series of courses in the history of political thought and oversee the Society of Tocqueville Fellows which is a select group of students chosen by competitive application, which meets several times a year to discuss contemporary political questions in the light of the unique perspective created by the sustained study of political philosophy. Finally, we work closely with the Political Thought Club, which is a lively, independent student group that meets on Friday afternoons to talk about works in this tradition. Right now, we're reading uh, René Descartes' Discourse on Method, uh, if that's your kind of thing, please come join us uh, some Friday at 3.30 in the afternoon in the politics department the, um, in the back. The Tocqueville program is supported by a broad coalition of philanthropic organizations and generous individual donors, including uh, Ginny and Sandy McNeil. Uh, Sandy is, is, is here with us tonight. Beth and Ravenel Curry. The HIP family, the AWC Family Foundation, Mary and Bill Howes, and Linda Gilkerson. Our sponsors support the Tocqueville program in the belief that genuine liberal education encourages students to become more thoughtful citizens and more dignified human beings, and we are immensely grateful for their support. You can learn more about the Tocqueville program's many activities and how to get involved with the things we do uh, from the materials on the table just outside the door. Check us out. If you are looking for a genuine liberal education while you're at Furman, we want you involved with our courses and other activities. Also, please join us after the lecture for reception, which will give you a minute to talk with Professor Deneen over some refreshments. That's going to happen. The, this, this wall over here is magic, and it will disappear, the um, revealing a sumptuous banquet of stuff. The, um, uh, please join us for that after the talk to, to chat further with Patrick Deneen. And please join us on February 25th for our next lecture by Dr. Shadi Hamid of the Brookings Institution and the Atlantic Magazine, who will be asking the question, can liberalism survive in an age of populism? So the theme of our lecture series this year is the crisis of liberalism. As all of you are aware, our American political order and political orders throughout the modern West and even the whole modern world have seen in recent years a sudden reopening of what we thought were long settled political questions. America's current president delights in shattering accepted norms of political behavior. It seems perfectly plausible to think that America's next president will be a self-described socialist, which is an idea unthinkable during uh, the second half of the 20th century. Britain will formally depart from the EU on January 31st. And figures who would have been regarded as fringy, ridiculous, irrelevant cranks, from Vladimir Putin in Russia to the Five Star Movement in Italy, have suddenly been thrust to the center of our political attention. The tectonic plates of our political life are shifting. So, for the next two years, the Tocqueville program has decided to address the most fundamental questions of our political life. The questions to which the answers determine the most basic orientation of our political order. What is liberalism? What have been the sources of its profound appeal to people and nations around the world? 
What are liberalism's characteristic weaknesses and shortcomings? Can those, def uh, can those defects be addressed within a liberal framework? Or is it time for us to once, engage, once again engage in what has been called epic political theory? That is, to rearticulate our most fundamental political commitments with an eye to our past, but without taking anything for granted. We could think of no one uh, better to help us address these questions than Patrick J. Deneen. Patrick Deneen is the David A. Potenziani Memorial College Chair in the Department of Political Science at the University of Notre Dame. He's written many thought-provoking books and articles, including a wonderful commentary on Homer called The Odyssey of Political Theory, and a number of fine pieces on our namesake, Alexis de Tocqueville. He's also taught at some of the nation's most prestigious universities, not only Notre Dame, but also Princeton and Georgetown. In 2018, he published the surprise bestseller, Why Liberalism Failed, a book that describes, as Deneen memorably puts it, how liberalism is failing because it has succeeded. That book has won accolades from everyone from Fox News' Tucker Carlson to former President Barack Obama, and it provided us with the intellectual impetus for this year's series. Now, Deneen is not only um, the man at the center of the question we want to raise over the next two years, also an old friend of the Tocqueville program, and a proud father of a fine Furman alumnus, Francis Deneen, who was one of our first Tocqueville fellows and graduated in 2017. It's our great pleasure to welcome back to Furman, Dr. Fr uh, Dr. Patrick Deneen. Thank you so very much, uh, Dr. Story and Dr. Story and uh, my old friend, uh, Dr. Tessator. Um, it's uh, as uh, Ben Story was just uh, mentioning, uh, our, we sent, uh, my wife and I sent our oldest son here. And uh, for those of you students in the audience, you, know, you can be sure uh, that when your parents send you to a college, um, they pretty much have to have to like, like it as much as you do, hopefully. Uh, uh, it was actually as a consequence of my having been invited here maybe about a decade ago uh, to give a lecture at that time on Alexis de Tocqueville uh, that I first learned of Furman and over the course of several days of being here and in particular speaking with its students, much like my experience today, I was, I was deeply impressed by, by this place, by its students, by its beauty. Uh, frankly, in South Bend, by its weather, I know you think it's cold here, but believe me, it's not cold. Uh, and um, uh, I, I hold it in such esteem that I'll be bringing my daughter down, uh, who's a junior in high school, uh, to, to look, take a look uh, when it does get warmer here, uh, hopefully uh, a little bit later this spring or early next fall. So thank you for having me back uh, to campus. It's really genuinely a deep pleasure to be here uh, and to uh, revisit some of, these, some of these places that I've gotten to know quite well. So as uh, Dr. Story was mentioning, and I don't have to tell you, uh, we live in this time of, of deep uh, upheaval and discontent. And one of the most striking things to me, even since the time that I published this last book uh, that was just mentioned, Why Liberalism Failed, is how even the descriptions that I offered trying to characterize our contemporary politics in just the course of a few years since its publication, since I finished writing it, how those descriptions don't really seem to apply anymore. And in particular, when we speak of the left and the right today, uh, there, it's not the same left and right that existed even just a few years ago. For those of us who came of age uh, during, in the period during and after uh, World War II and then through the Cold War, the dominant debates in the West pitted versions of what we would think of as the left, in particular forms of social democracy, kind of a egalitarian democracy, against what we were, what would then have characterized defenders of the right or figures on the right, who in particular sought to defend a free market, uh, a largely unfettered or significantly unfettered free market. This, uh, of course, marked one of the great divides between Europe and the United States. Uh, you know, so there was that old Robert Kagan book, uh, Europe is from Venus, Americans are from Mars. This kind of seemed to depict something true about these two places. And it certainly depicted uh, the situation in the United States where 
conservatism was understood to be the conservatism of Ronald Reagan, uh, and in particular, a kind of uh, mistrust of government, desire to unleash the power of the markets versus uh, the left side of the political spectrum, which was, uh, again, more concerned with sort of social welfare and social democracy. Uh, one of the ways that political science today plot out this political divide is through the inescapable uh, tool of political scientists, which is the four-part quadrant. If you've, ever, if you've ever taken a political science class, you can't escape the four-part quadrant. So I've, I've, I have here as an example, I hope that's up there, an example of the four-part ideological quadrant uh, that uh, helps to explain American politics. So on this quadrant we have on the, uh, think of, no, the vertical axis, we have conservative versus liberal uh, on the social issues. And so we can think of what some of those would be, issues like abortion, gay marriage, uh, immigration with the, the positive number, the number on the top, number one, being the most conservative. So sort of across these various issues, you would be the most conservative on those, uh, on those issues. And the negative one all the way to the bottom of the left uh, would indicate that you are very liberal on these issues, uh, much more permissive in questions relating to uh, the sort of social uh, issues, uh, the social the issues in the culture, so-called culture wars. And then the bottom, uh, the horizontal part of the axis measures liberalism and conservatism in economic matters. And here, the terminology can get really confusing. I was presenting this in Europe, and everyone was really, really confused. Because in Europe, if you're a liberal uh, in economics, it means you're a conservative. Uh, so uh, recognizing the complexity, all the way to the right uh, would be um, economically most conservative, by which we mean most libertarian. Uh, in other words, the most permissive uh, when it comes, or let's say the least likely to want to intervene in, uh, in economic affairs. So most dedicated to free markets. So Ayn Rand would be way, way down there and sort of the bottom right side, the most libertarian. And all the way to the left, the minus would be the most, what we would call liberal, or the most progressive or the most interested in sort of social welfare, redistribution policies. So the terminology can be a little confusing. So you would expect then um, a kind of, you know, a sort of, you know, a sort of a Hillary Clinton or a Bernie Sanders voter to be down toward the bottom left of this of this uh, electoral quadrant, and a someone on the right, someone a, a conservative, to be on the upper, sort of the opposite diagonal uh, quadrant. This would be the Ronald Reagan conservative, believer in free markets and family values, which was kind of the conservative core of beliefs, uh, especially during the 80s, 90s, and into the 2000s. Now, I teach, I teach a big class at Notre Dame. Uh, I, I, uh, it's become quite popular on campus, so I regularly attract uh, well over 100 students uh, to this class every semester. And the, I call the class Liberalism and Conservatism, and I just really try to instruct students on the philosophical bases of the various types of liberalism and various types of conservatism. It's, a, it's an opportunity for me to teach. Uh, you know, our conservative students think they're really traditional, but none of them have ever read uh, figures like Edmund Burke or, uh, or, or Russell Kirk, for that matter. And our, our liberal students often haven't read Karl Marx or they haven't read John Stuart Mill. So it's an opportunity for me to help our students encounter the philosophical sources of their own political beliefs and to sort of deepen them and sometimes to challenge them. And one of the things I've come to really like doing over the years is to ask my students at the beginning of the class to write a short two-page political autobiography in which they kind of describe their own political viewpoints and their political worldview. And I've been collecting over these. I've started doing this when I was at Georgetown for several years and then have continued doing it at Notre Dame. And what's, what has been kind of consistently the case is that my classes typically uh, cluster in the bottom left, sort of the progressive, economically more liberal or more, more redist redistributionist, and the upper right quadrant with a substantial showing in the bottom right quadrant or the libertarian quadrant. And over the years, that quadrant has been growing. 
even at schools that are uh, either nominally Catholic, like uh, Georgetown, uh, or even somewhat less nominally Catholic, like uh, Notre Dame, uh, the number of libertarian students has been growing. There's a kind of, I think, a libertarian ethos uh, among many of the students uh, of this generation uh, who prefer to be sort of non-interventionist in both sort of the social issues as well as economic issues. Uh, I think that's, you know, there's also a growing number of students who self-identify as um, socialist or at least uh, opponents of capitalism. If my daughter is any indication of this, she's, she's gone completely anarchist on me. Uh, so, uh, so what you see then is a map, and I, I, I couldn't, I'm really bad at doing this, I needed to be more of a political scientist, but uh, it's, it's something that looks like this. Uh, so that in my last, the last class that I taught, I had 35% of my students in the conservative Republican, the old Republican bloc. Uh, so roughly a third of the class. Uh, and that's probably unusual on an elite college campus today. I think it would be much lower if, for example, I was teaching at Harvard or Yale or Princeton. But I'm at Notre Dame, which is a bit more of a conservative school. And I'm a sort of by reputation sort of a conservative professor. So I probably get a slightly unrepresentative number of students in that upper right quadrant. Uh, and then I get a, a fair, you know, about an equal number of students who identify in the lower left quadrant of a sort of progressive. Uh, they're uh, on the social issues more permissive, more libertarian, and on the economic issues want the government to be more interventionist, more redistribution. And as I mentioned, I, I've seen over the years, so even since I began teaching at Notre Dame, uh, a rise from roughly 15% when I first started teaching there to more around 25% now of students who are libertarian, uh, sort of uh, consistently uh, sort of more that Ayn Rand or Rand Paul uh, kind of ethos that uh, prefer um, both uh, kind of lack of regulation or, or limitation in both the social and economic realms. And then this kind of peculiar small number of students in the upper left quadrant. And the upper left quadrant is kind of, it's the, it's the non-liberal quadrant, if we could call it that. It's people who are not particularly liberal when it comes to either and, and I mean this in the European sense, not liberal when it comes to markets, that in other words, liberal in the American sense, more interventionist in the markets. They want more sort of uh, social welfare policies. Uh, and also not liberal when it comes to the social issues, more conservative when it comes to the social issues. And this, this quadrant, uh, you know, this, these are where my monarchists end up, and there's always a few at Notre Dame. Uh, this is where my sort of cranky, old-fashioned traditionalist students end up, uh, and a few ne'er-do-wells are here. But it's roughly about 5% who have this ethos that I would just say is kind of consistent with sort of a Catholic teaching, uh, broadly speaking. But even at Notre Dame, it's only about 5% of the students that end up here. So as I, as I began by describing, in for many, many years, as, as Professor Story was just describing, for many years we had a very settled divide in the Western world, which was more or less the diagonal quadrants, uh, and in which the libertarians could kind of tilt the balance one way or the other. This really defined European politics. Germany was a really good example of this. The German government would be basically would be won by the Social Democrats on the left, or the Christian Democrats on the right, and the thing that would throw the election one way or the other would be whether the Freie Demokraten, the Libertarian Party, would form a coalition with one or the other. And so there was always this kind of, ultimately a kind of centrist trajectory of these various parties in which you would see uh, either the sort of, uh, sort of progressive left or the more conservative right and uh, more free market right uh, seeking to kind of win the middle win enough of the middle to put them over the edge. But the, this party divide was pretty consistent and pretty stable uh, over a long period of time. But in recent years, this framework has become far less secure and far less stable. And indeed, what we've seen is that under threats of what is increasingly a much further left agenda, we see this in the United States with the rise of uh, interest in socialism, as well as a much further right agenda, that these centrist political parties have been leaving aside their differences and forming centrist coalitions. So in France, you had cohabitation for a number of years, you know, the old communists and the, the conservatives uh, forming a coalition together. And in Germany, you have the Große Koalition, the, the two big left, center left and center right parties forming a single coalition. And if you've been paying attention to politics in Europe as well as the United States, what we have seen is the collapse of these centrist parties. 
Uh, they are absolutely bleeding support in, in preference to the rise of parties further to the right and further to the left. But I think the real thing that helps describe what happened in the United States and more recently uh, in the, le it, well, it not, depending on when you say more recently, but certainly recently in the, in the last British election, which is a continuation of the Brexit vote, is the rise of what happened in the 2016 election. So this is the same quadrant I was just describing. And whereas in our, you know, I would say in many of our elite institutions, certainly, I mean, even a place like the University of Notre Dame, a Catholic institution, you see a very low representation generally of people who express support for the upper left quadrant. But you could say, I think, with, with some confidence that Donald Trump won the 2016 election because he recognized, in the sense he's a fairly good businessman, he may not be as wealthy as he claims, but he recognized there was an untapped market and that the political parties were not, both the left and the right political parties were not marketing themselves to a significant number of voters who had occupied this upper left quadrant for a long period of time. Now, if you hung around a place like Notre Dame, hang around elite institutions, you might think nobody was in that block. As it turns out, there are no libertarians in nature. They don't exist by nature. They're just created in the laboratories in Cato Institute. <laughs> but as a general rule, they're very powerful when it comes to funding organizations. You can't you know, bump into a, a, an institution in Washington, D.C. without you know, run, running into a whole bunch of libertarians. But when it comes to the electoral map, what you notice is the bottom right uh, quadrant is almost empty. And you know, half of them voted for Jill Stein or whoever, I don't know who, who they might have voted for. It's, it's, sort of, it's, it's the other. But if you notice, what, what you have is you do have a clustering of obviously of the blue votes, as you would expect, in the lower left quadrant. And you have a clustering of the red, many of the red votes, many of Trump's votes. And each of these dots represents 10,000 votes, I should mention. You see a clustering of these votes in the, of course, predictably in the upper right quadrant. But notice it crowds over and it bleeds over into that upper left quadrant. This quadrant that, at least if my students are any indication, nobody really is interested in. And in many ways you could say this rise of what we describe as populism today is the rise of this otherwise unrecognized and fairly unrepresented population that neither party was really paying much attention to until the last election. I think this is not only true in the United States, but it was true uh, uh, for um, England and other parts of the world as, as well. So tonight I want to talk a bit about this phenomenon and what this quadrant in some ways represents and begin to try to talk about it and make some sense of it. Uh, and so in talking about populism tonight and for the historians and, the, and, and people with, with deep and, and, and uh, uh, pervasive knowledge of, uh, of populist as a historical entity, I'm not going to speak so much about that, although I'll, I'll have reason to mention it, but rather what I want to talk about is kind of what's represented and what I think is inchoately articulated by some of the people or many of the people who I think exist in that upper left quadrant, but because they are so poorly represented, particularly in our elite institutions, their voice isn't especially heard in our institutions. What it is they want or what they believe is not especially well heard in our institutions. Most of the treatments that I've been reading of late on populism, of course, are written by people from institutions such as this one, such as uh, uh, very you know, elite uh, at academic institutions. And most of these treatments that I've been reading regard this, this rise of what's described as populism as largely an expression of opposition, as a kind of negative uh, expression. And it comes to be understood largely by what it is not and what it is opposed to. In the view of many of its, uh, of its uh, students, those who are, are exploring it, populism is often described as a political movement born of demotic, not necessarily demonic, although you might think so, but demotic, demos, uh, po popular frustrations and discontents that with, 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 in their view, justified grievance threaten to undermine the norms and practices of liberal democracy, driven by resentments uh, that, uh, that are born of liberal democracy uh, by people who feel themselves to be beleaguered outsiders, especially outsiders uh, who are blocked from entry or even respect from the sort of dominant economic and cultural institutions. For example, I'll just mention a few of these studies. 
One is uh, um, one of populism's leading students and indeed critics, uh, a scholar named Cass Mude, uh, along with Christabel Kaltwasser, in a valuable little book, these little, little books that are called A Short Introduction. This is Populism, A Short Introduction. And then another study by Jan Werner Muller, a professor of political philosophy at Princeton University who wrote a book called What is Populism? Both, in both cases, these rather more prominent books argue that pop populism is effectively an oppositional movement of people who consider themselves representatives of the people and who divide the world, in the words of Casmude, into, quote, two homogenous antagonistic camps one camp being the pure people, and the other camp being the corrupt elite. This might be recognizable if you follow the president's Twitter accounts, for example. In the view of both Muda and Mueller, this relies upon a kind of monistic view of the people. In Mueller's words, a morally pure and fully unified people against the elites who are in some way morally inferior. Now, this division of the world into these two monistic and homogenous camps in the eyes of both Mude and Mueller, acts as a deeper attack upon pluralism and diversity, and ultimately threatens liberal democracy, uh, which is the political order that came into being in their understanding to protect and even foster pluralism. Both Mude and Mueller argue that populism is at base an opposition to liberal democracy itself, an effort to eliminate the fact of pluralism through the creation of a mythic people arrayed against an equally monolithic and equally fictive elite. Mueller describes populism, and I quote him, as a permanent shadow of modern representative democracy and a constant peril, a kind of evil twin born alongside liberal democracy, uh, one that um, can't in some ways be fully exorcised, but nevertheless is always a threat and needs in many ways to be confronted. Now, whether treating this phenomenon as a kind of temporary response to certain contingent events or as a more permanent shadow or evil twin to liberal democracy, in both of these cases that I, that I mentioned and many others that I, could, that I could rattle off, the main response to populism in this understanding is as a form of reaction. Now, from the, this is in particular from the vantage of the political order of liberalism, which I would describe as people who've lived their lives more or less in the upper right quadrant, economic liberals, even if they're social conservatives, and the lower left quadrant, social liberals, even if they're economically not, we call it liberal, but even if they're not libertarian. So even if, uh, uh, even if in some ways this is a kind of shadow uh, of ascendant liberalism, Populism is, is in many ways understood to be simply a kind of, um, uh, exactly that, a kind of shadow, insubstantive, defined against the real and only true legitimate order of liberalism, with its commitments to individual rights, limited government, the rule of law within a constitutional order, and representative government. I could go on sort of describing these various ways that these are described, but what I want to try to do tonight is to consider on its own terms what I see you know, through, through uh, my own efforts to begin to articulate what I think is being expressed in Coetly, especially by the rise of this uh, upper left quadrant, to consider the commitments of populism not merely within the standpoint of liberalism, from which, which those within this perspective see it merely as oppositional, but rather on its own terms. As, as an alternative with its own views of positive commitments and beliefs. I begin with a view that far from what, uh, what I've encountered in some of these works that regard populism as simply the sort of evil twin that was born from the, you know, the, at the same moment as liberal democracy, this is actually quite an old phenomenon, not merely a reaction to liberalism, but has a very old lineage, lineage with its deepest roots found in thinkers as, as ancient as Aristotle, as Cicero, as Polybius, as Aquinas and Machiavelli, as Montesquieu, all of whom recognized in the words of Machiavelli that there are two humors in any political regime. And that's not humor as in ha ha ha, it's humor as in sort of stuff that's in your blood. There are two humors, there are two sort of essences in any political regime. And in Machiavelli's words, these are the nobili, the nobles, the nobility, and the populi, 
So the very word populism comes from this very old word, at least in Italian and, and, and even back to Latin. It means the people, and by which they mean these, this particular humor that's permanent in any political regime. So what I want to suggest that tonight is that what appears to be a kind of negative project or a negative reaction from the standpoint from within liberalism actually touches on, indeed draws from, a much older tradition uh, that, that sees this as a kind of permanent essence, a kind of permanent humor or essence within every political regime and for a long time has been in many ways frustrated from a kind of expression uh, in American and more broadly Western politics. Now the essence of this popular humor, has, as I've mentioned, has been described by a variety of thinkers and I could add to the ones I've mentioned, thinkers such as Giambattista Vico, uh, Ed, 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 uh, Edmund Burke, um, Hume, I think Tocqueville in some respects recognizes it. Figures in the Republican tradition, of the founding tradition, I'll, I'll talk about in a little bit, the so-called anti-federalists, the, the, the people who lost in the founding debates. Religious thinkers such as G.K. Chesterton. British socialists such as William Cobbett, Cobbett R.W. Tawney, George Orwell, Karl Polanyi, uh, and more recently, the, the late and the great uh, intellectual historian Christopher Lash. They engage in many ways what is most, most certainly a critique of liberalism, but one that pre predates, in many cases, the institution of liberalism. And so, in, in many ways, I think it's, it's worthwhile to attempt to tease out what are these positive sets of commitments. Let me, let me list them in order, and I'll try to just say something about each of these uh, in, the, in the rest of my talk. The first of these, uh, the first of these kind of positive commitments is a kind of demand for a certain, let's say, to populate democracy, right? to populate democracy against what uh, often responds to the tendency of elites, nobles, the nobility, whether it's aristocratic or even in a liberal democracy, in an effort, uh, the effort of elites to diminish the power or the influence of these demotic influences. So while today we draw this distinction, or you often hear a distinction drawn between populism and democracy, there's a long tradition in this, I, I, what I regard as this kind of populist tradition, as an effort, in fact, to strengthen democracy, uh, to strengthen especially the voice of the ordinary people uh, in, in the political process. The second feature that I would point to, and this is really relying extensively on earlier work by uh, Christopher Lash is a critique of the ideology of progress. That the, the ideology of progress that it seems especially to be a part of built into assumptions about the modern world uh, is something that I think has been a long-standing aspect of populism and rather a kind of argument for a certain kind of sustainability. One certainly argues for a certain kind of sustainability in the human ecology. And I want to suggest tonight against all uh, even evidence that you might see um, in, in sort of our immediate political setting, um, a kind of, a, at least an articulation of a tradition that it seems to me could very easily, and I think uh, it's very likely, may well extend to a concern for the natural environment. Number three, a rejection of what in my last book, uh, what in, in the, the book on liberalism I call an anti-culture, the anti-culture of liberalism, and the argument that this populist tradition, in fact, represents a more genuine form of diversity and, uh, and, and uh, pluralism, as opposed to what it sees as a kind of homogenizing force of the liberal project. And so in particular, in both the United States today, and I think going back in this tradition, a kind of stress upon religious traditionalism that in the current context, very interesting, in, interestingly, brings together religious traditions that might once have regarded each other as enemies. I mean, you know, on this campus, an old Baptist campus, to have you know, a professor from Notre Dame would once have been unthinkable. Uh, but there's, in many ways, in the face of, of liberalism today, there's more in common in various religious traditions uh, than in, in an earlier time would have been recognized. And fourth, a kind of critique of oligarchy, a long-standing critique of oligarchy that is, in an effect, a call to a kind of mixed regime. This old, very old um, tradition in political philosophy of seeing that the essence of a more stable and sustainable form of politics is mixed regime. So we talk about the first of these, populating democracy, or kind of a, a, a support of democracy. 
Now, if we understand liberalism as a relatively modern effort to solve the problem of these two humors in politics, the, con the conflict of the elite and the populace that Machiavelli regards as a permanent feature of all politics, we would have to conclude, or I certainly conclude, that this is one among, among the most ingenious efforts to resolve the contest in favor of elites who would nevertheless claim the mantle of democracy, hence the word that we use frequently, words, liberal democracy. Now, it would take a longer story to explore how the, today's liberals came to embrace the label of democracy, but the architects of liberalism were under no such illusion. We can look to the founding fathers of America, for example, uh, the Federalists, who were quite explicit that what they were founding was a republic and not a democracy, and in many ways wanted to create a representative system that would constrain the power uh, of, of this demotic uh, uh, um, expression. And indeed, our Constitution, in many ways, was born out of, you could argue, the first populist moment in American history an uprising of farmers in the western part of Massachusetts, the Shays Rebellion, that scared the heck out of the property owners in the big cities. And it was decided that there needed to be a much stronger central government instituted in order to, in part, have the capacity to restrain these, dem these demotic energies, not only by the creation of you know, potential for a domestic army, but by giving sufficient power to the elites in the society through the representative system that we have, that the political power and influence of this more demotic aspect of our country would be relatively weaker, would be relatively less represented. And among the central core, core aspects of the debate that took place in the moment of our founding in the United States was a debate between those who represented a more populist position, again, the so-called anti-federalists, who wanted a much more broadly representative system. So they made arguments that today might seem quaint and odd. They wanted to have elected offices last for only a year and essentially be by lot uh, so that anyone could potentially become a representative and that it would be frequent turnover in office so that no one stuck around what was then the capital, New York City or Philadelphia, for very long. There would be no permanent political class. They called for an enlargement of the proposed House of Representatives, uh, calling for Rep representative district to be very small so that people would know their representative and that the representative would be much more likely to be drawn from the body of ordinary people from the uh, from uh, the, the uh, uh, from the uh, rather than uh, kind of those who would be more likely to be able to win larger districts because of greater wealth or visibility such a system was believed would not only be more democratic it would have certain consequences one that would encourage a policy that would be, in the, in the words of Melanchthon Smith, more likely to be governed by those who were virtuous, not because they were especially endowed with virtue, but because, as he put it, they lacked the means for their own satisfaction. They might be as selfish as the great and the wealthy and the powerful, but they did, didn't have as many means to achieve those ends. They favored a, a policy that would be more economically frugal, more likely to be composed of small business owners, small farmers, this is the kind of Jeffersonian ideal, rather than entangled in international commerce. Of course, the great opponent of this view was Alexander Hamilton, interestingly a hero of the left today, right? if, if, if uh, Broadway musicals are any, uh, any indication. Right? I mean, this was the great, this was the man who really wanted to unleash the commercial power of America and was very much opposed to this sort of Jeffersonian vision. Not quite a century later, J.S. Mill would make different arguments about the need to restrain the demotic element of society, but with similar aims in mind. His fears, uh, very much influenced by Alexis de Tocqueville, were uh, over the tyranny of a majority, but less the tyranny of a political majority. He thought that modern constitutionalism had, in some ways, constrained the power of majorities through various kinds of mechanisms. He admired the American Constitution. He was worried about the majority of opinion, right? the power of opinion, particularly as expressed through custom. Right? We don't do that. Right? There's no law against wearing that kind of clothing, but it's not, it's not acceptable to wear that kind of clothing. Right? We had a, a mother at Notre Dame write an open letter in our college newspaper asking young ladies not to wear the, the what are they, uh, the tights, uh, the, the, the leggings, leggings to mass. 
Right? It was very distracting to her sons. The response to her from the student body, you might imagine, was rather ferocious. Right? Now, mind your own business, you nosy lady. But what Mill was writing about was a time when you wouldn't wear leggings. He was writing in the Victorian era. Right? A young lady would not wear leggings. And a, you know, a man wore his waistcoat with his pocket watch, which I brought tonight, right? just so I could <laughs> express exactly how much I'm in the throes of custom. Uh, Mill was, I guess they're not a customary anymore. Right? Mill, Mill was concerned then about the domination of the customary as the, as, the, as the most threatening obstacle to genuine liberty. And in his great book on liberty, argued for not only just the, the limitation of the political power of the masses, but on the power of opinion in the form of custom. And in part, he argued that this, of course, needed to be protected politically. And among other things, he argued that there needed to be ways in which you could restrain the political power of the demos, as well as, of course, the kind of informal power of the demos. Maybe the most, uh, the most striking aspect of this argument was one that one encounters in his work, uh, uh, Considerations on Representative Government. Many of you might know this argument from John Stuart Mill, in which, which he proposed a form of plural voting, by which he meant some people would have more, more votes than other people. And that, in particular, it was he went through a list of what should be the requirements for some people having more votes than others, and he decided it would be people with more education. So when you seniors graduate, you might get two votes. You know, people like me with a PhD would get 50 votes. So the country would clearly be really well run if the college professors, you know, we could see how well we run our institutions of higher education. We would certainly you know, all be even in more debt if we, uh, if we ran the government. I think you see this, uh, this dynamic at play in the rise of progressivism in the 20th century, which was in some senses more democratic. It sought to open up. Uh, uh, such, um, uh, such mechanisms of uh, direct um, through uh, mechanisms of direct democracy, such as the initiative and recall and the referendum, but at the same time, it urged the creation of the, what we now think of as the sort of permanent bureaucracy, as the the role of experts to basically take the advice of the voters, which we known more directly, and then use that advice to devise policies that were those devised by experts. As Chantal Mouffe, who's a person well on the left, right, has written a book called For Left Populism. Chantal Mouffe has written, liberalism's apparent democratic sympathies rest on a deeper commitment to a kind of post-politics, a politics of technique, a politics run by bureaucrats, administrators, uh, judiciary in preference to the legislature. Uh, a, a, pol a politics, frankly, that I think it makes someone like my, my mayor, Pe Mayor Pete Buttigieg, very attractive, right? Someone who worked for McKinsey, who studies all the data and makes conclusions based upon the data, a very technocratic view of politics, that politics is a kind of science or a technique to which you devise certain kinds of solutions. Uh, but that it, this technocratic and managerial account has to, in some ways, limit the power or influence of the people who will not be as expert, who are likely to be subject to drifting tides of opinion, belief, and even passion. The effort of populists to wrest from liberals the substantive belief and practice of democracy today is thus not just a stance in favor of majoritarianism or egalitarianism, but a substantive belief that the, the ordinary views of ordinary people, those people who are subject to the laws, to the administrative state, to the decisions of the judiciary, are better able to run their own lives and together to collectively reach the decisions than a lot of experts are. And a very long-standing tradition in this populist tradition is a kind of suspicion toward expertise. And this is really an interesting aspect of populism. It's getting a lot of attention today. It's often framed as people who like science and people who don't like science. But I think it's better to frame this as who should run sort of our politics. Is it sort of a technocratic, meritocratic, uh, scientific, sort of elite, people who are, have a certain kind of education and orientation? Or is it, or is it uh, sort of everyday people uh, who themselves have a different set of criteria for evaluating what constitutes good policy and good politics? I think this is one of the core areas where we're seeing a debate today, for example, the rejection of rule by bureaucrats in EU in preference to rule by parliament in England, uh, which I was in England last semester and was able to observe close at hand. So this, this aspect connects to my second, the second substantive point, which is a kind of skepticism toward an ideology of progress. And I want to say an ideology of progress, not opposition to progress or improvement, 
but a kind of ideology of progress in which it's believed that whatever it is we do now, and indeed whatever, whatever was done in the past, is patently inferior to what we are destined to do in the future. So a kind of, you could say, a constant discontent with whatever the contemporary order is in preference to a yet to be defined better future. You know, the view in particular that dismisses the past as a, as a time of backwardness, of, uh, of recidivism, and uh, therefore deserving relatively little um, embrace. One can identify, I think, elements of populism, certainly in this longer tradition, that resist, among other things, rapid transformations in both economic and social forms. And I think this is a real hallmark of this upper left quadrant, sorry, upper left quadrant today. And it's expressed, so this is where I think, in part, why you see this view not well represented in our elite institutions. Whether you're a progressive, so notice the name progressive, or you're someone in the upper right quadrant, an economic libertarian, you have an implicit view that change and transformation is good. Right? It might be change and transformation in the social realm. So the old definition of marriage, the old definition of family, the old definition of woman, what, take what you, what you will, all of these are now have to be put aside in preference to the creation of a new, more open, more fundamentally transformative understanding of the human person and human relationships. Or if you think about a libertarian view of economics, I think there's no better phrase that captures this than that of, uh, um, uh, than that of, uh, uh, I can think of the phrase but not the author, creative destruction, help me out. Schumpeter, Schumpeter thank you, I was going to say Schumacher, but Schumpeter. Uh, Schumpeter uh, famously described capitalism as a basically a process of creative destruction. Right, the constant upheaval that we know to be the case. Right? Every time I come back to Greenville, there's 5,000 more restaurants and you know, 6,000 more coffee shops. And you know, who wouldn't love that? But the, the constant upheaval as a kind of fundamental part of what it is that we understand progress to be. And if you think about what defines these people in the upper left quadrant, it's a resistance both to the kind of progressivism of, in the social sphere as well as an opposition to the progressivism in the economic sphere. And this is what makes this sort of difficult for those of us in more elite circles who are actually, we're programmed and indeed our life is oriented toward the expectation of succeeding in a transforming world. That's one of the things that we learn to do at institutions like this, to be prepared for a transformed world. And I think the hallmark of people in this upper left quadrant is they want things to be more stable, not merely economically, not merely socially, but both. It makes it hard for people like us who populate these institutions to sort of comprehend their existence. Who doesn't want transformation in the, either the social or the economic sphere? Right? I'm always amused when you, know, you probably read reports about how college campuses are riddled with you know, massive numbers of, of liberals, leftists. Professor, professoriate, 95% of the professoriate is often left liberal. But we always point out we have some conservatives that are in the economics department. Uh, and they, they like free market economics. Those are our conservatives. So think about it. What our campuses are defined by are people who want this kind of transformation and indeed expect this kind of transformation. I think then one of the ways you could say uh, that, that defines this upper left quadrant, this kind of populism that we're seeing today, it's an echo of an older kind of populism that was resistant to economic transformations in an earlier era, the earlier era. The Industrial, Reformation, uh, the Industrial Revolution, for example, or 19th century transformations in the American economy, the introduction of the railroads, of, um, uh, of, of an increasing sort of financialized economy. This aspect of populism has often been described as a commitment to producerism, a commitment to uh, especially an economy and social order that emphasizes the role and the centrality of small producers, family-owned, family-centered kinds of production. This is the arguments that you encounter, for example, in Christopher Lash's book, 1991 book, well worth reading. I think Christopher Lash predicted the rise of the left, upper left quadrant before anyone did uh, in 1990, 1991 in his book, The True and Only Heaven, when he talked about this populist tradition in America as essentially shattering what was then the left-right categorization and really a tradition in America that had been largely forgotten that uh, put a particular uh, spotlight and uh, um, value upon this relatively small producer and owner um, that called for a certain kind of economic decentralization in the name of a kind of independence and the cultivation of certain kinds of virtues arising from the practices 
that arise, or that, that themselves arise from a producerist economy rather than the, the economy that we have, which is much more of a consumerist economy. Uh, Lash, in fact, wrote, uh, penned in my view, probably the most important essay that helped to predict and I think describe the rise of uh, this form of populism in a book entitled The Revolt of the Elites. I recommend the lead essay to all of you. Uh, it's a relatively short essay in which he described really the, what he saw as the growing divide between, which again wasn't strictly a left-right divide, but a divide between people who were essentially defined by the capacity to be mobile with portable skills and people who did not define their existence by mobility and did not value or prize uh, portable skills, rather skills that were often set in particular places and in particular traditions. So Lash was in particular well, well aware of this tradition um, and, uh, and sought to, um, I think sought in many ways to describe uh, what he thought might be the new political divide in America and across the West. So third, and I think related to this, is a kind of defense of culture. A defense of culture in particular against um, what in the liberal frame and what in my book I describe as a kind of anti-culture. Liberal anti-culture as I was describing when I was uh, talking about J.S. Mill is, it describe, is in many ways marked by a kind of opposition to the despotism of custom, as, as Mill put it. As I was saying before, right, the, the idea that I can't wear what I want. I can't believe what I want, I can't say what I want, I can't do what I want, because people don't think that that's acceptable. And in order to liberate people from the despotism of custom, what liberal orders tend to do over time is not merely to liberate us from custom, but to reduce culture more or less to consumer products. Think about how much we engage in cultural practices. We get to go to lots of restaurants from different traditions, wear different clothing from different traditions. But how many of us can actually say we're actually of a culture? Right? We actually practice a certain kind of culture. Maybe we do. Maybe this is what this is, our clothing and our hairstyles and so forth. But how many of us have these sort of deep-seated practices uh, that have developed over generations that we learned and practiced because our parents and our grandparents and our great-grandparents did it? Maybe the one example is if you put up, you put up a Christmas tree every, every you know, in the, in, in the beginning of December, right after Thanksgiving most mind-boggling odd thing to do that you could imagine. Like, why in the world would you cut down a tree, a perfectly good tree, and put it in the middle of your living room where it will die and spread needles everywhere, unless you were part of this custom that once believed that unless you lit evergreens on December 21st, the sun would go out. That's the origin of the Christmas tree, a kind of pagan custom to burn the only thing that was alive in the middle of December, right, which was the evergreen and to send its vital power up to the sun, which was dying. And guess what? It worked. It worked. Every December 22nd, the day would be a little bit longer. So yes, let's keep doing it. So we keep doing this. We have this custom. But how many of these customs do we really have? How many of these traditions do we really have, do we really inherit? One of the hallmarks of a liberal culture is to free us from traditions, to free us from these cultures that bind us, that limit us, that define us. It seems to me that in many ways, again, this upper left quadrant is in many respects, um, I, would put, I would describe it as a insufficient, not well articulated, often ham-handed effort to say, we are cultural creatures. We're creatures who need and desire customs. And in many ways, if you're kind of aware of and you follow um, a lot of the data that, that tracks kind of the differences of classes today, it's in particular the people who are um, kind of what we think about as flyover country in middle America or in uh, areas of uh, kind of economic deceleration that in many ways are the least likely to have access to or at least successful practice of custom and are most suffering in, many, in some respects from its absence. In many ways populism has been historically and I think even today in interesting ways closely aligned with a revival, or at least an expressed revival, expressed revival and commitment to religion. Uh, certainly in the 19th century, if you're familiar with 19th century American populism, the figure of William Jennings Bryan uh, looms large, who became quite well known for, among other things, his 1896 convention, the Democratic political convention speech in which he described himself as being crucified on a cross of gold evoking this image that the gold standard was the equivalent of Christ's crucifixion. 
and received rousing applause as a result of it. Who would have known that getting off the gold standard was, was, was once, you know, just the most vivid religious commitment you could have. Brian, of course, also became rather infamous, those of you who may have read the play Inherit the Wind, as the figure that defended uh, the, um, the defended the school district uh, or prosecuted um, um, Scopes and I'm sorry, defended Scopes and the Scopes. No, 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 he prosecuted Scopes and the Scopes monkey trial. Sorry, forgetting my my play. It's been a while. Uh, as the figure who especially was sent up in that play as this sort of backward figure, this benighted figure. And I think you know, in many ways, the sense that Brian himself was seen as this sort of backward figure very much animates the sense of sort of defensiveness and indeed a kind of uh, more assertive kind of religiosity that you saw in the 19th century and that you see today. We witness today, of course, a kind of symbiotic relationship in these democratic, uh, these populist democratic uprisings and the call to and appeal to religious belief and culture with attendant, often effusive public expressions of religious belief that were believed to be no longer permissible in the liberal order. I'm struck, uh, tomorrow there will be the March uh, for Life on the, on the occasion of the anniversary of the decision of Roe versus Wade. And I, I don't know if anyone, any of you realize this, no Republican president has ever, no president period, has ever appeared in person to speak at the March for Life. Donald Trump is going to go tomorrow. The man you maybe least associate with Christianity will speak at the March for Life. Again, a demonstrative effort to say, I am with you. I am one of you. Right? I might not be a good Christian, I probably arguably he's certainly not, but he wants to be sort of demonstrably in support of people for whom this issue is like a central and defining issue of their understanding of what it is to be a Christian in the modern world. And we see, of course, these demonstrative expressions around the world. In Hungary, where I visited just this past fall, and I actually met uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, Viktor Orban, Orban has, has made it um, uh, part of his express policy to advance family-friendly policies, really interesting policies. Uh, if you're a young married couple, uh, you can take out a loan, something equivalent of $30,000. And if you have one child, still married, uh, 10,000 of those dollars are forgiven. And if you have two children, 20,000 of those dollars are forgiven. If you have three children, 30,000 of those dollars are forgiven. So it's a family slash child-friendly policy that's encouraging young families to have children. Uh, in part, maybe a bit of a financial bribe, but also the sense that I think that many young people have that we can't start a family yet because we don't have enough money. We can't save money for a down payment of a house. So these kinds of policies, uh, or for example in Poland, uh, which has instituted a policy of closing all stores on Sunday, which shocked me that they were open on Sundays, but I think that's a legacy of the communist time, but explicitly so that people, families could spend time together on Sundays, that everything would be closed on Sunday. Can you imagine what would happen in our country if we closed doors on Sunday? It was only true a generation ago, but we'd see a collapse of our economy if people couldn't shop 24 hours a day. You see a kind of expression of demonstrative religious piety from many populist figures recognizing a kind of hunger in a cultural wasteland for some kind of public expression and support of, of in many ways, cultural and particularly religious expressions. But it's not only, I think, cult religious expressions. I think it's also in many ways about different understandings and expressions of our relationship to place that you see expressed in, uh, in contemporary po populism. As, as I mentioned, one of the key features of those who occupy typically the lower left, the upper right, and certainly the lower right quadrant, those who would be defined by various kinds of liberalism, is the capacity to thrive in a highly mobile society, right? the capacity uh, to thrive with the expectation that wherever it is that you happen to be born won't be where you're going back, you know, that, unless you happen to be born in New York City or Washington, D.C., uh, that you won't be going back there. And indeed, it would be a mark of your failure and a failure of your education if you went back. Right? Yeah. Parents would say, why didn't you study harder? Why are you back here? Uh, the, the, in many ways, uh, what uh, Wendell Berry has called the only major of, uh, of higher education is upward mobility with a stress upon mobility. It doesn't matter what you major in, that's what you're really majoring in. Uh, what, one of the aspects, it seems to me, that one, one finds among those who would, I think, find scattered in the upper left category is a kind of re resistance to the idea that mobility and portability should be the definition of what it is to lead a successful life. 
Areas of the world that are experiencing the highest degree of populist support are typically marked by people who, I'm going to use a description or words from a book by David Goodhart, a really good book called The Road to Somewhere. And he contrasts somewhere people to anywhere people. And people at institutions like ours are definitively anywhere people. That is to say, he contrasts those who value home and stability and generational continuity, tradition, memory, to those who what Pico Iyer has called a global soul, the capacity to live and thrive anywhere. Gain skills that are gained and honed at institutions like this one, the ability to be anywhere people. According to Goodhart, and I'm going to quote him, such people have achieved portable identities based on educational and career success which makes them generally comfortable and confident with new places and people. In the view of anywhere people, these ruling, today's ruling class, those who remain somewhere, often inundated by rising social pathologies, in fact, in some ways, deserve their fate. And I could quote you from, I think, a rather striking set of observations by a political scientist from the University of North Carolina, who essentially says these people have invited this condition on themselves for not leaving, for not renting a U-Haul and getting out of town. The French demographer, I think almost a contemporary version of Christopher Lash, his name is Christophe Guilly, he's written a, a book about this default belief that one should simply move where opportunity happens to be, that this reflects the bias of a small and overrepresentative liberal elite that in fact amounts to what he calls the myth of widespread nomadism. He notes that while the choice of remaining in places one knows and cares for can come at economic costs, and I quote him here, that for lower classes, relocation is almost always a wrenching experience, very seldom something that they would freely choose to do for themselves. Guilly sees evidence of a de facto and increasingly political effort, as he puts it, to return to sedentism, sedentary, sedentism to demand that good and decent work be kept in place, hence the movement for tariffs to recreate a kind of industrial uh, base of, of our economy, so that either good work be kept in place or that it be moved to the periphery, that good jobs be moved out of the urban cores where they tend to be today and moved to the periphery. Thus he argues that a rejection of the liberal belief to be nomadic is, in his view, a kind of ethical standpoint, supportive of a kind of localism that can, among other things he believes, contribute to uh, climate change and environmental degradation. I've had a number of conversations with students today. What would, what would happen if all of us just to chose to travel less? Particularly those of us who are like college professors like me who you know, get invited to places like this. You'd have to talk to each other. That would be terrible instead of having me come here. Lastly, let me, let, me, let me move to a close here. In opposition to oligarchy, a kind of classic feature of, of populism is opposing oligarchy, however that's described, the kind of elite of its, of its age, and in its place, not merely proposing that we should replace you, but a kind of implicit appeal to a very old tradition of the mixed regime, the idea that a regime needs to have a mixture of classes. Now, in theory, this should be the American constitutional order. And this was in many ways intended by our founders through such institutions as the House of Representatives and the idea of federalism with the states having a certain amount of power so people more locally could govern themselves. But as we know in today's Washington, D.C., it's not exactly a highly representative institution. The Senate is filled with millionaires. You can't even become a senator without being usually a multimillionaire. And even the House of Representatives, you have to usually have a significant amount of money uh, to be in the, in the, uh, in the House. The, in many ways, I think there are aspects of the contemporary populist party that is attempting to displace or reorganize our political order to have a greater aspect of mixedness, to mix the classes, uh, to encourage a kind of um, uh, mixing of, of, of classes and roles. Uh, I think one of the ways in which you're beginning to see this is a kind of growing populist animus to institutions like this one. Maybe not Furman in particular, but especially the elite institutions, Harvard, Yale, Princeton. And if you followed the last tax bill, right, what could be more boring than a tax bill? Uh, well, what the government that can tax, the government can destroy. And what you may have noticed is that for the first time in the United States history, the government put a tax 
on the endowments of universities of a certain size. And I know this well because Notre Dame fell under this, uh, fell under this tax. Right. Why was this? This was, you know, in part to get some money, but it was mainly to show that we, who run the government today, understand the game. And if you seek to destroy us, we will destroy you. We'll destroy you through the power of taxation. Right? Well, we can begin to tax, we can continue to tax. I have never in my life seen such a growing movement among conservatives who a generation ago were totally anti-government and totally anti-taxation, eager to tax the endowments of the likes of Harvard and Yale and Princeton. Not because they think it'll be a great source of revenue, but they see this as in some ways the fifth column, the opposition, the place that creates the people who are attempting to destroy them. So I think institutions of higher education are one place where you're going to see not only an increasing animus against these institutions, but the promotion of trade schools and community colleges as places where people will want to sort of put their buck uh, rather than the kind of legacy institutions with the moral prestige of such institutions as Harvard, Yale, Princeton. Beyond universities, again striking. A generation ago, one wouldn't have expected this, but if you've been paying attention, from the floor of the Senate, we've had speeches from Marco Rubio, Josh Hawley, denouncing monopolies, and in particular, the monopolies of the technology industry, and calling for their breakup. These are Republican senators uh, who are calling for anti-monopolistic stance toward uh, what they see increasingly as extraordinarily powerful monopoly positions uh, with social and economic power uh, that not only uh, is um, economically threatening, but also, uh, in their view, uh, represents a social view and social position that is uh, um, well, to the, well to the left, well toward the lower left part of the, of the scale. The episode of the uh, effort to pass a Religious Freedom Restoration Act in my state of Indiana remains close in the memory of many of these people, and I don't know how well it remains in your memory, but in this case, the state legislature of Indiana passed a Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which is what many states have. And also the United States government has a Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which gives a kind of special protection to religious belief and religious practice. It was voted unanimously by uh, the Senate, uh, overwhelmingly by the House in the 1990s, and signed into law by Bill Clinton a generation ago. When the RIFR was passed recently, when Mike Pence was governor of Indiana, a large number of major, very large corporations threatened the economic ruin of Indiana if they didn't reverse this bill. And this, this effort to reverse this bill was cheerled by people who normally denounce c corporations for interference in democracy. So it was a really striking example in which you suddenly had a kind of progressive friendship to corporations and an increasingly conservative reaction against corporations. And I would say, you know, among the most striking things of today's populism, this kind of more right populism or left populism, is a kind of willingness to uh, denounce and indeed criticize corporations and even capitalism. It's striking uh, in, in, in our time. I think uh, one other aspect, one other way one sees this is the effort, as I was mentioning earlier, the effort to redistribute work good work around the country. And I was paying some attention to this because having lived for many years in Washington, D.C., I was always struck by the artificiality of having to have all of these government workers living in this you know, incredibly wealthy, incredibly prosperous city, especially at a time when we have you know, the ability to communicate electronically. And it seemed to me kind of a, a little bit of a self-serving way in which uh, those who worked in the federal government kind of made sure that they were living in a really nice place by having very good jobs and a lot of wealth in this very concentrated pocket. And if you read the Charles Murray book, Coming Apart, what you see is that uh, seven out of the 10 wealthiest counties in the United States are in or around Washington, D.C. today. Not even New York City. It's Washington, D.C. What does Washington, D.C. produce again? I, oh, yeah, power. <laughs> power, right? Uh, so one of the more interesting things that uh, I would pay attention to was recently uh, the Trump administration redistributed some jobs from the Department of Agriculture. Two divisions of the Department of Agriculture were moved from Washington, D.C. to Kansas. And this caused an absolute uproar in the Washington bureaucracy, not just in the Department of Agriculture. But everyone knows that they're under the threat of having to move to a place like Kansas. And what worse fate would there be than to have to leave Washington, D.C. and to live in a place like Kansas? <laughs> 
I think in some ways you could say this is a one way in which this idea of a mixed regime will manifest itself. The effort to increase the power and the presence of those who are in the, the losers of our, uh, of our economy and of our social state into positions of power, at least respect, and the effort to decrease the power of those who run the country today by direct attacks often on its universities, efforts to redistribute work, efforts to demote certain kinds of positions. And I would expect this would be a continuation of part of what was going to remain what I think will be a very long battle and a very long and lasting realignment of our politics. I think our politics is likely to remain divided no longer between those two quadrants on the upper, upper right and lower left, but between a kind of blending of the quadrants of the upper left opposed to aspects of the further right, lower right, and lower left. And this is not only true in the United States, I think it's true across the world. And for this reason, I think in particular because this movement poses a real threat to higher education a real threat to institutions like this one because it views increasingly this, this institutions like this as its enemy. Never in American history has there been a, such a partisan divide in its view over the universities in which you have vast numbers of people who identify as Republicans and increasingly in the upper left quadrant who view universities as agents of their destruction, as agents of undermining everything that they hold to be dear. I think it's incumbent for institutions like ours and people in institutions like ours, not merely to quickly dismiss this movement, which I think is often the case, but to attempt to understand it, maybe even sympathetically attempt to understand it, maybe reject it at the end of the day. But unless we do so, we, institutions like this, which I deeply value and don't want to be destroyed, we, it seems to me, bear a particular responsibility to attempt to understand this phenomenon. And in understanding it, perhaps, perhaps, bridging a divide that threatens to tear our country and our world apart. So I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, with your analysis of liberalism. 
Thanks. That's a great question. Um, you know, um, I, I'm familiar with the argument of uh, uh, Thomas Mann and Norm Ornstein. I respect their work a lot, but I think they really are representative of the old settlement. You know, that this is the order they grew up in. And I think even the quote you, you reflects the idea that this is the norm. And this sort of new alignment represents such a departure from this norm that it's now extreme. But it's only extreme if you view the norm that this is given. This can never change, right? So the, the center is only the center as long as that's what regards. So, you know, if we go all the way on the left and we say this is where the center is, that's where the center is and anything to the right of that. So I think it's, um, you could say that what they're witnessing is an unsettlement of a, of a settlement that they themselves deeply supported. And any, any departure from that represents a kind of extremism. What I find most interesting about this, and I, and I hope I was able to draw out some of this tonight, is I just think that this, you know, to the extent that, and what's really interesting is if you look at that upper left quadrant, it's really a mix of red and blue, right? It's a mix of people who would describe themselves as economically, uh, economically more liberal and socially conservative. And so, you know, whatever is more salient might be what moved them to vote in that quadrant, but every one of the people in that quadrant views themselves as economically liberal and socially conservative. Is this a right-wing movement? Is this a left-wing movement? I mean, it's, it's always categorized as, uh, as a, as a right-wing movement. But what's striking is that if, if you had a generation ago a Republican party that said it wanted to you know, preserve social entitlements, people would have fallen off their seats, right? Even increase social entitlements, right? Boris Johnson ran in England on increasing funding of national health service. Right? This is not Margaret Thatcher's Republican party by any stretch. So I think, you know, I, I think the characterization of right and left, it comes obviously from the way in which the left party, if you look at where, is Hillary, where are Hillary Clinton voters, they're way down at the bottom of the left. You know, and this is where you know, Biden is trying to run more toward the line up above, and he's not succeeding very well. He's been forced always to renege on positions he once held. Um, but he's trying to run, he's trying to basically capture, he understands, right? he understands how how Trump won, which was by getting enough of the people from that upper uh, left quadrant to vote for him. And if Biden can run in that area, he can perhaps capture enough people to vote for him. But I, I think the characterization of uh, you know, someone like Ornstein and Mann, and that what we're seeing is this radical right uh, phenomenon, it's, it's certainly right when it comes to certain issues. Right? So I mean, maybe everyone in this room would agree, it's really conservative when it comes to immigration. Right? It wants to limit immigration. It doesn't believe that the free flow of people should be uh, a position that everyone su should support. Now, if you're old enough, and I'm not that old, but I'm old enough to remember when this was a core position of the Democratic Party. This was a core position of the Democratic Party that you had to limit immigration, particularly low-skill immigration, because you didn't want to hurt the earning power and the bargaining power of the working class. Right? The nearly sainted ex-president, former president, late president of the University of Notre Dame, Theodore Hesburgh, whose name is invoked with like, as if you're invoking the name of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph on our campus, as a paragon of social justice. There's a picture of him arm in arm with Martin Luther King that gets trotted out you know, every year this week. He was on a commission that recommended limiting the number of immigrants, low-skill immigrants in the country, precisely because he wanted to defend the status of the working class. Now, this is now defined as right wing. A generation ago, or not even, this was defined as good liberal position. So I think we have to be careful about how we're using this language of right and left, because I think the problem is we're in a world in which those terms just don't mean what they used to. And we're seeing a real readjustment in these, uh, in these senses. You know, just, again, just to put a point on this, if you paid attention to what happened in the, in the election in England, you had people who have historically been laborers, people who worked in mines and in factories and in you know, farms and uh, in every hill and dale people who for generations, not only them, but their parents voted for labor, voted Tory. The Labor Party is the party of London. Labor Party is the party of people who live in the urban center, people who are financiers, right? and people whose work depends on the wealth of financiers. And the people who used to be understood as the heart of labor voted for the opposite party, the party of Margaret Thatcher. What's going on? Who's left? Who's right? What's left wing? What's right wing? So I think we need to, in some ways, get ourselves past the labels and understand that what we're seeing is a real realignment of our politics that's scrambling all of the categories. And it, it puts us in the hot seat at these kinds of institutions because we represent the opposition to them.
And it's not enough for us simply to say those people are racist and bigoted and they're all just being elected because of Russia. Because that is essentially a way that we are protecting our status, I'm afraid. Or at least we should be suspicious of our own motivations. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, that's such a great question, and it's a really it's a difficult one to answer because I think um, I think it's um, in many ways what what we're witnessing is a. It's not as if you see your, what you're witnessing is is people who are, you know, deeply, you know, deeply manifest a sort of deep set of cultural traditions being threatened by this anti-culture. I think that, you know, you could say that people in the upper left column perhaps have more contact with a traditional kind of society. But in many ways, these are people who are watching, you know, probably more television than a lot of us, that are, you know, consuming endless amounts of crap from Walmart and, you know, every other institution that, uh, retail institution that makes pl cheap plastic stuff. These are people who are, you know, eating at the crassest, you know, the kind of restaurant that we would put up our nose, you know, Applebee's, and, you know, <laughs> chi Chili's, and, you know, places that we don't eat at, right? These, these are people who are not, let's, let's not call them paragons of culture, right? I think they are very much defined by the anti-culture, right? But as it turns out, we who live in the kind of anti-culture thrive in the anti-culture, right? It's precisely that capacity to be mobile, and to have these portable skills that is in many ways, that's precisely what we sought to create, was a place that would give us, certain, we would have certain advantages because of the diminution of certain kinds of cultural forms. It would liberate a certain kind of class of people. People, you know, what, um, you know, a book that I really recommend to all of you is, I've been touting it everywhere I turn, is the recent book uh, just published this week by Michael Lind called The New Class War. And he returns to an old category, a description of our class as the managerial elite, uh, as it's sort of the, uh, that what our skill is, is the capacity to manage modern organizations. We're not necessarily property holders, right? Most of us are just mortgage holders. Uh, we're not necessarily, we're not necessarily kings of business, right? We don't necessarily own businesses. But what we have is a set of skills that lets us run the organizations of the modern world. Right? And, and it doesn't matter whether you're making a lot of money doing it or relatively little money. Like those of you who are assistant professors in this room, I'm sure you don't feel like the elite, but you are, right? Because you're part of the managerial class. It's not wealth necessarily, it's whether you have those kinds of skills. And, uh, and, and part of what Lind argues is, is that it's, it's in particular the creation of a world in which you would have this flattening of sort of cultural forms that would advantage those of us with those skills. But it turns out what it really does is to disadvantage those who don't have those skills. So rather than having certain kinds of cultural forms, practices, traditions to fall back on, what they're finding is that they have none of that. So I don't, so I don't want to say that what we're seeing is the assertion of a strong sense of cultural identity against this anti-culture. I think it's a kind of reaction against this anti-culture isn't working for us. Right? And we don't know what we want. So we're going to make a lot of demonstrative expressions of our religiosity, and we're going to vote for somebody who's clearly not himself very religious. Right? Like Boris Johnson and Donald Trump are strikingly similar in this respect. Right? Um, but that uh, it's in some ways a kind of cry for help, uh, more than anything. Uh, and I, uh, so in some senses, I think, um, you know, I, I don't disagree with, with an argument that Charles Murray makes in his book, Coming Apart, that uh, the elite in some ways needs to preach what it practices. 
Right? What it practices very well is stable families, uh, children who are raised in a, in, in a married family. Right? We're actually really traditional. Those people in our class are highly traditional when it comes to family values. But as a class, we deny that such a set of values should be given a kind of priority. Right? So I don't disagree with Murray, but I don't think it goes far enough. Because I think what it tends to neglect are the kind of institutional forms that are needed, especially in these kinds of communities in which you, what you've seen is the decimation of all of the old institutions. The unions have died. Right? The churches are declining. Uh, the, you know, the old guilds, the old associations, the stuff that Putnam talks about, all of those have declined. So what can we do? What can people in our class do to help that? I'm afraid that if we, in some ways, want to save the republic, it means that some of us have to live in these places and help run these institutions. We can't all live in Washington, D.C. because they need people like us to help run these, form and run these institutions. This is a great consequence of this sort of geographic resettlement. So the reculturation, the reculturation of America is going to require, it seems to me, the capacity of people of our class to recognize that simply banding together and living in like one of five cities is really bad for American democracy. Now, I'm not saying we're just, we should just force everyone to relocate, but it is something we should be talking about at these institutions. I think a place like Furman, a place like Notre Dame has to be talking to our students. We don't all have to live in New York City. We don't all have to live in Washington, D.C. You can be a really gifted lawyer, a really gifted uh, doctor, a really gifted whatever your profession is in lots of places in the world. My God, you can even be a gifted professor in Greenville, South Carolina. I've heard some are here. <laughs> I think we've got time for one more. Oh, sorry, I've gone so long. Uh, that's, I, makes, I love how you ended because it kind of segues into what I was thinking about. So Furman is an interesting place. It's an elite institution in Traveler's Rest, South Carolina. <laughs> We're a complete institution, so you can stay here. It's not even in Greenville? It's, it's, yeah, it's sort of in Greenville. <laughs> okay. If you head out these doors, what I'm trying to say is if you head out these doors, within here, there might be a lot less people in that upper left quadrant, yeah. but half a mile off campus, not true at all. Exactly the same in my institution. Totally. Yep. And uh, that just makes me think, if we're talking about not sort of staying insulated in an area that would just dismiss those people, what might somebody like me, who's been shaped, uh, basically, I'm, I'm concerned about some of the top left things. But yeah. if I have a friend or a coworker who really resonates, who really mm -hmm. finds himself in that quadrant, partially because they feel attacked yeah. by people like me who yeah. have been studying my fancy books and my fancy yeah. school, how can I address them yeah. and maybe be helpful with some of my concerns yeah. and to save democracy to work for the good yeah. without just being another sort of liberal elite educated person coming and attacking them and sort of making them dig their heels in yeah. and they were right about it all. Yeah. What's your name? I'm Zach. Zach. That's a, it's such a great question. Hey. It's something I, something I uh, agonize over because um, I'm, I'm part of the problem, I think. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm teaching at one of these institutions. I don't live in my hometown. I, you know, I'm disconnected from uh, you know, people like my, my uncles who you know, we get together on Memorial Day weekend and they just fix, fix cars. You know, this is, these were my people and I'm not among them anymore. And yet they live a you know, half mile you know, in every, every direction from where I am. Uh, one of the things that seems to me that, especially institutions that are, like ours that are geographically where they are, so Notre Dame and, and, and Furman are very similar in this respect, we prize, and indeed I think there's an entire office here, if I remember correctly, that's all about giving you experiences, geographically diverse experiences, right? And who doesn't want to have a trip like I just did last semester, spending the semester in London? And who doesn't want to go and spend a, you know, a couple of weeks in Rome or wherever it is? And then we congratulate ourselves that we have provided for our students this incredibly rich experience of diversity and cultural pluralism when the entire time you've been hanging out with people just like us. Right. Uh, you've been just you know, basically in a city generally uh, filled with people who more or less hold the same views. I mean, you know, get different kinds of food and you might, you might hear some words that are strange. Um, but, you know, going to London this semester, uh, you know, it was, it was wonderful. But it could have been any city in the world in some senses, you know, increasingly. And yet, the idea that what we should really be doing is giving our students real cultural diverse experience by sending them a half a mile away from campus. That would be a cultural experience. Then you'd be, you'd be experiencing something really different. Right? But that's, that's in, in, say, I think it's really telling. And again, it might be the case that you have programs here that do that, and I'm really glad that you do. But I think we really celebrate 
you know, going off to these various abroad programs, these various cultural enrichment programs, because that's, you know, that's in our, that's in our wheelhouse. Um, but it seems to me that we, these institutions, uh, that I do think are really, have a really profound responsibility um, to be conscious and aware of the ways that we are complicit in the creation of the divide that we always decry. Our institutions are all filled with egalitarians, but we are systemically involved in the process of differentiating the classes. That's really one of the main things that these, these institutions do, is sifting the winners from the losers. And if we don't want to, in a sense, you know, experience what Marie Antoinette experienced in the French Revolution, and I would not recommend that, then we, it seems to me, have a, it's really incumbent upon us. Uh, you know, people from that part of the world aren't necessarily going to be coming to our institution, though I think we should be doing a lot more to see if we can find ways to bring people of varying classes to our institutions. Right? These institutions like this don't merely have to be serving 18 to 22 year olds. Uh, who have the tuition money to pay for it. I think we have a real, a, a real um, a duty to think of ourselves as educators who are educating people from every walk of life and in every age of life, and to think of ourselves increasingly as places, especially in, in, in the parts, geographic places like this, who can really uh, offer something really substantive to people uh, who might not think of themselves as college material. But to allow us to, to encourage our students to be encountering and engaging with people of different classes, of different backgrounds. Uh, I've often thought, since, since I live in uh, South Bend, Indiana, that it would be really a wonderful thing for us um, to, and I, I'm not looking into this, to us to have a program where we have students spend some days, maybe a weekend or something, living on a farm right, right off campus, right? Any number of farms right off campus, or spending a little bit of time with an Amish family all over the place in, uh, in uh, near South Bend, Napanee, Indiana, and so forth, that we, right on our doorstep, there are people who are really, you know, you want to talk about cultural diversity, right? There are people mm -hmm. out there who, for whom it would be genuinely discomforting for us to be with. It would really put us ill at ease in a way that going to London or Paris will not. Uh, and I think would be sort of genuinely educational. And I think we should be thinking inventively and creatively about ways that we those of us at these institutions can do this, both out of self-interest, self-protection, not to become Marie Antoinette, I think in a deeper sense. This is what it is to be a citizen. It's what it is to be a sort of responsible member of the elite uh, to, uh, uh, to reach out to people who are not in our class and I think who would benefit from this interaction as much as we would. So I really appreciate the question because it's one that keeps me awake at night and, uh, and I hope that it's something that we can collectively as these institutions begin to talk more frankly about.